Uh, my name is Tim Barwise. I am a forester with the state uh, of Massachusetts. I work exclusively on Asian longhorn beetle. My office is in the city of Worcester, right next to the Mass Lottery building. That's a lot of fun. Um, and our headquarters is right in the core infestation area where it was first detected. Um, this program started in 2008 when I, I'm not going to go over everything I talked about originally in the little 10 minute presentation earlier, but cover some of it quickly. Um, basically, a, a, a grandmother was watching her kids in the backyard of Triple Decker during the summer. Um, a couple, maybe a quarter mile away from the introduction point of this insect. And she was very concerned that these bizarre looking bugs were raining out of the trees all over her deck, all over her lawn, and the little kiddie pool that her kids, her grandkids were playing in. So she looked it up and saw that there was a wanted bulletin for this pest. She reported it to the New England, well, the um, Southern New England State Plant Health Director at the time, who came out, looked at it, positively ID'd it as Asian longhorn beetle. And there was a precedent for that in other parts of the country. Um, like I said before, it was first detected in New York City in 1996. Uh, it affected the boroughs of Brooklyn, Queens, maybe Manhattan, I'm not sure. Um, and uh, later on spread to central Long Island, went over the river to New Jersey. Um, it was then another separate introductions uh, found in industrial parts of Chicago, industrial residential, similar to the part of Worcester where it is now. Um, Toronto, shortly thereafter. Worcester, uh, then in Boston. Uh, and then in, the most recent one was found in Ohio, which is a very rural area outside of Cincinnati. Um, all of these places are pretty different, but the thing they have in common is that uh, it's in the Northeast, and there are host tree species available for the beetle to eat and infest, and they seem to be separate introductions from Asia, uh, linked to global trade, specifically uh, from infested wood packing material, pallets, dunnage from shipping containers, um, crates, things like that, raw materials coming from overseas for industry. So, where we found it, it uh, was a, uh, an area with a rail line going through it, moving this stuff across the Northeast. Um, it came before there were international regulations on the treatment of wood packing material. We have those in place now. You see a pallet that you burn it in the yard and you want it to say HT on it, right? So you're not putting methyl bromide into your lungs, right? Methyl bromide is the other treatment. Heat treatment is the one I just referred to. Those things kill whatever is inside the wood. Um, other insects have come here, other, who knows what other sorts of pathogens that you can't really see readily. Uh, but since then, uh, we hope that those new introductions are limited. So um, the US Department of Agriculture uh, and Customs Enforcement have all sorts of interesting trace back protocols to see where these came from, if anyone violating the law, smuggling, that's, it's all cool, but that's not what I do, unfortunately. I'm just out there uh, coordinating certain aspects of the operation on the ground, and I interact with the federal officials um, to enable them to cooperate with us. They give us funding, and uh, we provide them legal resources and some field staff and expertise to go out and actually conduct the surveys and remove the infested trees and do outreach to the public. So as is obvious by this, the mustard color areas are places where if the beetle was detected, it would have a lot of host species available for it to infest. You guys know why you're at this talk. I'm not going to go into more detail about that. So it was first found in uh, 2008. Um, it's almost 10 years that we've been uh, working on eradicating. Uh, last time the quarantine zone expanded was 2011, so that's a good thing. It hasn't um, expanded any further for about seven years. Uh, it does encompass the entirety of four towns and two parts of towns adjacent. Um, and that quarantine zone is a state law that prevents the movement of uh, regulated articles from inside to outside. So anybody who is in um, the firewood industry, uh, logging tree companies, landscaping, um, we reach out to them or they come to us and they enter a compliance agreement with our program uh, to work on host material within that zone. They know they can't move it outside. We provide them a disposal yard inside the core affected area 
um, that will take any wood material they can't get rid of on their own, um, that they can't ship to uh, one inch in two dimensions, which would kill the beetle, and we will do it for them. So that's a, that's a service we offer to them. We even take stumps for the time being, and uh, traffic is brisk there. People really like taking advantage of that. Uh, like I said earlier, over 24,000 infested trees have been detected, but the number is much higher, actually. We've removed 36,000 or more. Um, those include high-risk trees that probably were infested, but just in the beginning of the program when they're getting it off the ground, uh, a lot of voluntary uh, host removals on people's properties. Um, and, and like these are very tightly um, uh, developed areas, you know. But nearly conti contiguous uh, Norway maple canopy for this insect to move and proliferate. And so, um, you know, the, the idea of doing these high risk removals is really critical to getting a uh, grasp on it quickly um, as we got the whole program going. Uh, and to complement that, over 50,000 trees were replanted that were not host species. And that area looks a lot different than it used to just 10 years ago. Uh, this is a picture of the quote-unquote mother tree. It was found in that kind of industrial area. It's a landscaped tree, uh, so I'm not really sure why, but the first, uh, the first pregnant beetle that emerged from the uh, pallets was attracted to it and made it to it. And uh, it is a sugar maple. Even in this area that was dominated by invasive species, the Norway maple, it found the sugar maple to infest. And you can see in that picture in the lower right, as they started to limit and take it down, all of those brown spots on it are new, like brand new egg sites. Each one of those would turn into a larval tunnel that would go into the cambium um, and then into the wood for a couple years before it emerged as an adult. You can imagine what would happen in just a few short years because of the, the pressure on that tree, it would absolutely kill it in short order. Um, and then it will emerge. Uh, we have seen longer periods of development within the wood, but I think two years is a good bet. Southern Ohio and other warmer climates, it has a one-year life cycle. Up here, I can't really say, but it's probably pretty similar to Worcester if it was here. We base a lot of our knowledge also on Canadian um, research that's been done, and it seems pretty applicable. Uh, the host list, all hardwood trees, um, and our landscape, obviously maple is one of the most prevalent hardwood trees. It doesn't go after oak, so we don't see, that's probably the other most common one we have. Uh, you don't see it bothering oak at all. Uh, it doesn't bother walnut, it doesn't bother, um, I'm trying to think of other examples right now. I'm so focused on these. Right? Uh, but it does go after a lot of your trees that uh, I noticed on my ride up. So poplars, absolutely. Birch, absolutely. All species of sugar, uh, all, I'm sorry, all species of maple, willow, and whatnot. So before I get into the stats of what we're doing, any questions on beetle biology or host trees or anything like that? Okay. So, from our ground inspections, we uh, have the, the crews go out, they access every single property within that regulated area. They go to door to door, identify themselves, access the property, and then do the tree inspections. So they look at every single tree, um, determine whether it's a host or not. If it's a host, they measure it, enter it into a spatial data collection system, uh, and they speciate it. And then they will mark it with a lumber crayon and start to uh, inspect it from root flares up to the very tops of whatever is visible um, from multiple angles with binoculars, with the naked eye. If they see anything suspicious, they flag it for follow-up by a tree climber to get a closer look. And we do this in all seasons. The only time we're not surveying out there is when there, uh, there's uh, uh, snow or ice on the branches that would hide damage, <coughs> or uh, if the tree is wet from rain, where you also can't really see the damage. So in our surveys, we've collected this data. We've looked at millions of trees, of host trees, and uh, as you can see, the forest composition of the affected area leans heavily towards maple. Um, tapers off greatly, and there are some bizarre species on that list that I've never seen before. But um, anyway, maple is popular where we live. 
And of the, of the uh, maples that we have inspected, most of them have been red maples. Uh, that's just, I, I mean, I don't want to put a figure out there, but it's probably about half of the hardwood trees we have. There we are. So close above damage on a branch, those are old and new egg sites. And then on the lower left, um, you can see that crack. That's a larval feeding gallery. So that's a few years older than the um, other, the very orange looking fresh egg sites. Each one of those would, uh, if the egg was viable and hatched, would turn into one of those larval feeding gallows as it enters the wood. That's the damage we look for. Um, and uh, we also look for the holes and we look for the frass, the excrement of the beetles that tunnels through the wood. Um, you can see a little bit of that in the crotch of the tree in the lower right. And again, from my earlier presentation, this is a tree that's, I don't know, probably dead in New Jersey. I've, I've, people do ask, the, have you ever seen it kill a tree? Well, I haven't seen it kill a tree, but I've seen dead trees killed by it. You know, it happens slowly, it happens over time, and it's very much a factor of how big the tree is and the pressure on that tree. So uh, what we try to do is get to it before it's even been infested, and then if we do find it to be infested, hopefully it's a year, two, three years at most. This one's a 10-year-old tree. So, you know, if we weren't doing this program, if we weren't fast enough at doing this program, or if someone didn't report it and just let it fester for a while, the tree will die. Long before the tree dies, of course, you have to worry about, for you guys, is it functioning? As, is, it, is it moving uh, sap up and down? No, of course not. Um, is it uh, a threat to health and safety? Of course it is. If it has a target, it's a hazard, right? So just this insect is, is, a, is a problem, and people, I'm not really sure where they get the idea that you know they can wait a while to see if it's a problem or not, but um, you know, it, the tree loses all of its value once it's infested. It goes into the wood, you can't use it for anything except for firewood. Obviously, firewood is a very popular way for the beetle to move. It survives in firewood for um, much longer than the life cycle. It goes into this uh, weird kind of like suspended animation called estivation, where it will just live in this dead wood um, off of the residual moisture. And then once the conditions are right, if the, tree, if the wood gets wet or something and it's, it hits that sweet spot temperature, it'll just pop out again. So that's what you see with the uh, international trade, right? Cross sections of damage. Um, Excuse me. When yes. You, when you uh, cut down a tree, say in the forest, it's infested. What happens then? Is it they're still sitting there on the ground? Oh, I'll, I'll get to that. Yeah, we, we, uh, we don't leave any infested material lying around. We, uh, we destroy it. Burn it? Uh, we chip it. Burning would work too, but we don't have any. Chipping happens fast, and then the chips can be moved outside of the quarantined area, so they can be bought and sold, used by landscapers, used in biomass facilities. So it doesn't survive in the there's, there's no way for it to survive. I'll get into that a little bit more. Um, and if I forget, remind me, I can tell you more about it. Uh, this, uh, unfortunately, this presentate, this little animation doesn't work on this, but uh, the red dots are infested trees. Um, that's the core area that I've been talking about. Um, and it really, it will just show the spread, of, not the spread over time, but our detections over time as we move from that central area. Uh, in concentric circles around farther and farther and farther outside. We found fewer and fewer trees infested. The density was much lower, so it had spread, and it had spread a great distance basically to the extent of each regulated boundary. Um, but the intensity was very, very low. But just because the insect doesn't move very well, it's not. All the outlying areas were uh, either from it um, really intrepid beetles jumping periodically from generation to generation to start small populations, or from humans moving them accidentally. Uh, it really likes to live in the tree it was born and procreate on that tree and perpetuate its generations on that tree or its neighbor's trees. Um, thankfully, they don't fly very far, which is why we can eradicate it. And just to highlight that, um, tree detections over time 2008, it was only a few months we were working on the eradication uh, program doing the inspections from August until December. They found about 5,000 infested trees. And then uh, the next year, they found twice as many. 
and then the next year as they move farther away, it dropped down that much more. And it stayed pretty constant until we had reached the uh, edge of the infestation. And when we went back into the center, we did find residual infested trees, and we do expect to find residual infested trees. Um, I'll get into more uh, of that later because that's pretty consequential. Um, but you can see the numbers have been falling in half as we resurvey those central areas that were really heavy hit and where a lot of removals took place to handle it. Um, and as we move farther away, where the population was less dense to begin with, obviously, you find fewer infested trees. So that's a good sign. Percentage of host trees infested, the Norway maple takes it away up there. Um, but like I said, it was practically a monoculture in the area that it was first detected, so that's not surprising. And then red maple coming up close second um, because of its prevalence in the landscape. Um, just to compare and contrast, the two landscape types we're working in, uh, the city of Worcester is uh, pretty heavily um, developed, but there are some more natural areas, so we do see all host types present within the city confines. But again, Nora Maple is more than half of the infested trees uh, found within um, that the city boundaries. And then when you go into a, a town like Boylston, which is just a, a few miles away, uh, you down by the highway, you get almost all of them are red maples and sugar maples. Um, there's a lot of conservation land, watershed protection land in the city of, in the town of Boylston. Um, properties are much larger, have a lot of woodlot associated with them, um, second and third growth forest, uh, and so that's why you see fewer invasive Norway maples. But this shouldn't infer preference by the beetle as much as just availability of, its, of food. Picture of a crane removing a tree from a residential area. Um, removal, uh, it's the only way to control the insect. So the entire tree needs to get removed, chipped, and then the stump is wrapped. We find infestations in root flares. We find infestations in stumps. Um, I saw one tree that was like a landscape, probably like eight inch red maple in someone's front yard, and there were eight exit holes right at the base of the tree for some reason. There wasn't any damage anywhere else on the tree, but the beetle that laid those eggs just wanted to go in circles around the ground. That would have <laughs> been a big problem if we had allowed it to stand because it would have just fallen right over on the driveway. And then to complement um, all of these, we have other methods where we, uh, we offer, we, we have offered replanting. That is a separate funding stream than the eradication program. Um, it's complementary, and right now, honestly, we, we don't really have any requests within the affected area because it, it's so, uh, um, canvas so heavily for replanting early on that people just don't want more trees. And uh, there are, uh, there's a uh, nonprofit that still works with the city of Worcester to do street tree replantings and maintenance and stuff like that. Um, so we don't really do replanting as much anymore, and we're also re removing hardly anything compared to the past. Uh, there's a research component where we engage with different um, federal and state researchers to uh, look at other control methods, other detection methods. I'll go into that later. Um, insecticide treatment is an official control method. It's been used in Worcester. It's been used or evaluated in Ohio. Um, but it hasn't been done since 2011, and it's something that we consider in the future, possibly depending on the circumstances. Um, but in order for it to work, the tree needs to not already be invested in the field. So that, in the past, was a problem. As we get closer to actually shutting the program down, that might be something to reevaluate. And uh, finally, outreach is probably the bread and butter of what all staff do. They love going out and working with the public, engaging with homeowners, talking to kids or whatever. Um, this is how we find the automobile. Aware, public awareness is the reason why we believe if it was anywhere else, we find out about it, we respond fast enough to control it, and we eventually remove it from North America. So here are some examples of ground surveying conditions. In the upper right, you see a lovely woodlot where people are just going tree to tree, inspecting through the canopy. The lower left may be less lovely. City of Worcester is very typical for these kind of overgrown environments where you don't even know where the ground is half the time. That's always fun. So you can also see in the lower uh, 
right there, they're looking at um, a very heavily foliated tree in someone's backyard. Um, we love looking at trees when the leaves fall off, but we have to do it year round. So successive surveys, different times of year, that's really important. So we can revisit an area with enough time to give the beetle uh, the beetles time to complete their life cycle at a manageable population density so that when we come back we'll be able to actually see it. Um, here is, uh, you have a, a wood sample in front of you so you kind of got a taste of what we're looking for. Um, the top two pictures are a, an egg site that's very small um, at eye level, easily missed, and then uh, peeled away to show the egg inside. You can see that staining there. It's one of the diagnostics we use. Uh, again, the picture of the branch collar that's deteriorating from the larval feeding. And in the lower right, a uh, ALB uh, pupa right before it's emerging. They look like a little alien. Um, and uh, yeah, I think they're great when they look like that. Some of the uh, <laughs> realities of removing trees in the urban environment, dealing with living fences. Our contractors are um, required to make the property uh, in the same condition or better than they found it, and we pay them for that. And it's it's you know it's a price we have to pay in order to maintain trust and confidence in the program. So any damage done to a property, even when it's not their fault, but the Beatles' fault, it gets changed. So they do a lot of fence repairs and whatnot. We've got some great pictures of trees growing through chain link fences, but I want to show them to you. And here are some examples of our larger scale removals. Uh, the top two pictures are the same woodlot before and after. Um, there's a story behind that. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we hit um, high risk tree removal really hard early on in the first couple years of the program. But there was pushback from municipalities to not um, do too much. They were afraid of political damage, especially when it came to their city parks. And so that's a city park. Every, I think like 80% of the trees in that section of the park were um, Norway maples, um, but it's, it was a treasured park. It blocked the highway from um, the uh, people who lived nearby. So the, understandably, they didn't want to do this proactive um, tree removal for trees they didn't know were infested. Well, guess what? They were infested. The first go around, it wasn't that heavy, so the, so the inspectors understandably missed it. That one day, for whatever reason, the light on the right, or the clouds were too dark, or it had like rained for five minutes or something like that, and the binoculars were wet, and they missed the damage on a couple trees. We went back five years later when this picture was taken, and I was in that woodlot with them, and it was just like, you just spray painted everything. Everything was infested. And it's funny because uh, there were only a couple trees that actually seemed to have been infested at the time that it was first inspected, so they probably looked like those uh, lightly infested trees we were going to cut down at the time, but now they were just absolutely riddled, getting close to um, that earlier picture I showed you. So just in five years, uh, which was a little too long, uh, but you know this was right when we started resurveying again, um, the beetle in those specific trees had reached a breaking point, basically it spread to almost every single host tree in that area. So. We did a full host cut, and that just illustrates how many host trees were in that woodlot. Uh, they were almost all Norway maples, and the only things left standing were basically pitch pines and red pines and some apple trees. Um, that's a really dramatic shot, and it was not very big, not a very big area in there. Um, so, um, the lower right too, we have uh, some general forestry equipment there, forwarder, fell a bunch of off in the distance. We use, uh, we, our contractors use everything to do these cuts when, when they need to. And then in the uh, lower, uh, other lower picture, they have a, um, uh, that's a large uh, wood grinder that we have at our disposal yard, deregulating the material. So to answer your earlier question, we have engaged with researchers who come year after year after year to do chipping studies to ensure that it actually works. And uh, there's, even on a small um, disc chipper with, you know, like a six inch inlet, there's absolutely no way the insect can survive that process. There's the forces of inertia ripping it apart with a soft body at that time when it's in the wood. Um, and then the, you know, impact of the blades and then the resulting chip pile is wicked hot. 
we have to, we're, we're required to keep them a certain height or else they'll spontaneously catch on fire. So there's, there's no way for various studies that uh, anything can survive that process and uh, it is absolutely safe to move. But that being said, the chips do need to meet the standard of being one inch and two inch. So if they're bigger than that, you know, we run them through again to regrind them so they're the right size. Before and after of that um, core area, uh, there, the streets were lined with Nora maples. And then after they went through and removed just the infested trees, you see in the right hand picture, there's only one lonely Nora maple left. But if you look at the bottom picture, it too was infested. They just didn't know at the time. So they went back and removed it. And that lower picture really proves to show what the reforestation program has done. Um, it's hard to say from that, but this is probably like five years on from the planting of the trees, and they're just now starting to provide some shade to the sidewalk. It's a great loss for the people who live there. Um, but uh, the ALB uh, infestation, um, working in concert with a, with a really intense ice storm that winter, uh, it really did a number on these trees and exposed just how bad the infestation was in this area. So of all, all of the people, all the stakeholders and people who um, suffered because of this insect being there, those people in that core area, they definitely suffered the most. Do you replant with uh, a different species? Yes. Uh, we replant with a variety of non-host species. So um, popular trees are various conifers. Um, they lean towards shade trees, so they like to plant um, you know, a lot of oaks that do well in an urban environment. Um, tulip trees, sweet gum, those things are kind of novel in the landscape, but still will provide shade and do well in that kind of warmer urban environment. Um, and also for, those are like street tree replanting species they've done. Um, for homeowners, we gave them a choice out of the catalog. They'd have a forester go out and kind of take a look at the site, see what would do well, at, talk about the homeowner's criteria, what you want, and they have a catalog available. Unsurprisingly, they almost all fit. But there's a huge host list, and people just didn't want to wait it out for a shade tree, you know. Um, so, you know, the shade trees are all along the street on public right of ways. Um, there's some homeowners who took them up on that, um, but a lot of uh, ornamental dogwoods, crab, um, dogwoods, um, yeah, here's crab apples, uh, cherries, uh, Japanese tree lilacs. That's a nice one. So the idea is to restore a more resilient urban canopy than was before. Uh, that way, if any new pest came along that was a, a, had a preference for a specific genus, if it got out of hand, it wouldn't really get that far out of hand, like it had here, where there was a monoculture with Norman maples. And uh, I'm not sure how clear you can see that on the screen, but just aerial photography showing the, the extent of the canopy before and then after the large-scale removals in those areas. So this risk model that I mentioned before is our, a new development that we have been developing in-house in Worcester with uh, some cooperators from the Forest Service who um, take our infestation data, distance from infested trees, intensity of infestation, and then they'll age the damage that they find by doing cross-sections and counting the rings. It all goes into the multivariate uh, model that predicts the highest risk of where a new infestation might be detected <coughs> on the next survey. So uh, we look at factors like the beetle's natural dispersal, and that's based on um, a bunch of like different um, data points that we'll collect from each infested tree. Wind direction, prevailing winds move in the flight season from uh, the south west to the northeast, so we see a trend towards that. And then the distance from uh, human uh, risk factors, like firewood operations that might have been distributing infested material before the regulations came into play. Um, distance from major highways, railroads, things like that, another possible human risk factor um, for beetles to hitchhike along these pathways. And the density of the infested trees and host density in particular areas all goes into this multivariate risk model. And then we take that risk model and we overlay it with our actual like survey planning map. And that's what you see on the right 
all of the greener areas. We've resurveyed for a second time. The red dots are infested areas. Um, so that was from the past year. We're making great progress towards the edges. And uh, we use it for future planning. Um, time estimates on how long it will take to complete the resurveys. The color is graded towards how risky it is. Uh, so we want to get there first. Uh, like I said earlier, we, we want to give it enough time for the damage that might have been missed the first time to start showing itself from a new generation of beetles, but not so long that it's had a couple generations and gets the leg up on us. So we've kind of re hit the sweet spot of staffing levels, um, contracting uh, staff, and doing um, like timing the survey so we get at certain places at certain times um, since they were last surveyed to hit it right when we can remove almost all of the newly evident infested trees. And uh, we even look out two years in advance. So this is these are areas we want to get to in the future. Everything plays on that funding, um, how many staff we have, how many staff we can hire, which is a problem at the federal level and the state level. Um, and uh, it, it, but it, without the risk model, we wouldn't really be able to react with any sort of agility. It would just be this blunt force, like we take what we can get and we'll get there when we get there. And at that rate, who knows, we probably never would really be able to get the upper hand on the beetle. But because of it, we've proven that um, the model actually works. So that's encouraging. Um, this is just a chart showing about 5% of beetles emerging will move beyond the, uh, the tree that they're from. Um, so one out of every 20 beetles will move beyond the tree. And so obviously as you get towards more beetles dispersing from an area, a heavier infestation, you'll see um, the probability of detecting them um, as you survey farther away from that um, going up. So, we look at that factor when we decide how big our resurvey buffers are going to be. And this is an example of a resurvey buffer where we have a couple infested trees in the middle there, and then we do the analysis based on how many emerging beetles there were from those trees to de determine how many, um, how big the buffer should be for us to be uh, have a high confidence that we'll find it. So to increase that confidence, we'll have the ground surveyors go in first, uh, and then have the climbers go in to a certain distance, and they get a real close look. Uh, so we're looking at, uh, for this one in particular, you see three infestations on this map. The center one is the first one that was found, so they made the, the model, and it shows that if we were able to allocate enough resources to survey 1,500 meters away from that central area, we would find this other infestation that we didn't know about. Unfortunately, it wasn't possible for whatever reason at the time. So we only made it out to, I think, maybe the 80th percentile of confidence, find 80% of dispersed beetles 400 meters away from that central area. Regular surveys went on. We found that outlier. We knew it was connected. We knew that the risk model would have worked if we had had it at the time and we had been able to um, put the resources to work on it. So, all three of these are likely connected infestations that just kind of jumped short distance, less than a kilometer away from each other. And this is an example of different size buffers, different response sizes for us, depending on how many infested trees and how many host trees are around there based on previous inspections and data collected. So to complement all of this core um, affected area inspections that we do, we also have inspections outside of the known infested area. We call those regulatory site inspections. Um, we use our staff to uh, kind of take data collected from the compliance agreement program and reports from the public on, um, or even just observations from when we're out and about. We see an unusual tree company that we didn't know about and they're from, you know, Gardner Masses. Um, and then we we will interview them, ask them what kind of work they do, how often they come in the regulated area or whatever, um, and then we go to their site and we will inspect a certain distance around where they process firewood or timber, where they store their equipment at night, um, and give them outreach material, and we do this all across the state. So this is what we're trying to employ more and more each summer to kind of get out there and find anything that might not be reported. Um, 
like I said in my first presentation this morning, this is just to kind of illustrate that, you know, public interest or concern about ALB peaked around 2010 when it was really intense, and it's stayed relatively the same ever since. So that is hope that if someone um, finds a suspicious insect or damage in their tree and wants to know more about it, they will report it to us uh, regardless of the knowledge they have of how devastating it can be for their personal property. Um, you know, people don't want to be a bad neighbor, right? They don't want to know they have something that is going to spread to their neighbors, um, threaten their business, their livelihood, or whatever, give them a bad reputation, and get them chased out of town. So they report it sooner rather than later, and uh, more often than not, it's not. Because, you know, the upside, upshot of all of this, I think, is that people are more, and it's where we are, more aware of what, of their forests, of their trees, of what's normal and abnormal, and they have many more questions, and the more questions you have, the better, right? So they reach out to us and we, we give them whatever information we can, we can um, and hardly ever does it result in actually finding an infested tree. So uh, this one would be interesting to you guys, I think, because imidacloprid is a, it's a hot button issue. Um, it's a neonicotinoid pesticide that uh, is used all sorts of applications. It was used, it, it, it does, it is a label for use against the long longhorn beetle and other wood boring pests. Basically how it works is when the um, adult goes to chew on the leaves or in through the cambium, it contacts this chemical and it basically freezes its mandible so it can't eat anymore and will stop the life cycle there. That being said, we're not really sure that it works for a tree that's already infested. So when we were trying this out in those little uh, shaded areas out on the perimeter. The hope was that it would knock down any populations that might be there trying to get in to those areas that were heavy host and treated. Um, and, you know, at the time, just with resource allocation and how intensive it was to actually go tree by tree and inject this pesticide, um, it didn't seem like a reasonable approach to controlling the beetle. Um, that being said, in the future, after we found fewer and fewer, we might be interested in protecting very high value areas or whatever. Uh, you know, it, it could be reconsidered, but for now, with that and you know, the growing awareness of neonicotinoids and their effects on pollinators and on food crops and things like that, um, for sugar maple trees, uh, uh, obviously you probably shouldn't tap a tree that's been treated with a medical Um Those are all things that go into this. Uh, analysis of whether it's a useful tool, and right now for us, it's not. I'm happy to take more questions about that if you guys are interested. And we do have uh, separate funding from the Forest Service to do uh, detection tracking around uh, areas where we, uh, regulatory sites of concern or areas uh, that have a lot of hosts or whatnot that might be hard to survey. This really, the beetle not being very good at flying doesn't really encounter these traps very well, you know. Uh, we have found many uh, beetles and traps, but mostly when the population is really high. So now that it's negligible, um, you know, we probably we didn't find anything last year. We probably won't find anything this year, hopefully. Um, but it still serves a purpose in the whole overall program. If we found something in an area that we weren't scheduled to survey for five years or whatnot, that's great. We'll get someone there right away, and that early detection. Um, really helps shorten the overall timeline of eradication. And we're even looking at drones. Everyone's looking at drones these days, right? So um, the USDA is really interested in looking at drone technology to uh, mon uh, to do uh, sterile release of insects for agricultural crops uh, over large distances for um, measuring things for. Uh, checking shipping containers for Asian gypsy moth larval masses. For us, we're interested in seeing if the technology is good enough to actually uh, find ALB damage on a tree that we can't safely inspect, or it's in a swamp or something like that. And right now, we've been told that, you know, the cameras are good enough. Uh, we've had one field trial, more of a demonstration by a company that wanted to show it off uh, for DCR, for the Watershed Management pro Program, and for the ALB program, and uh, they they were a smart company. They they uh, put on a good show, but the product just wasn't there. Um, not at this time, but with working working with them, maybe eventually we'll have something useful for us. And we're always looking for new detection methods. So that one's hopeful and interesting. And this is the one I'm really excited about. 
beagles. Um, early on in the program, they were giving uh, beagles a shot. What they're trained to do is detect the sawdust, the grass, and they'll alert if they find uh, you know, an area that smells like beagle grass. So it wasn't useful at the beginning because everything smells like beagle grass. Uh, going back into the future, they're talking about it again. Um, and it really, like the traps, uh, might help us kind of pinpoint in areas. You take a dog for a walk through the woods, it sits down, and you're like, wow, maybe we should look at this area closely because we didn't plan on coming here. You know? Obviously, I'm very excited. I love beagles, so that will be good. Well, that's all I got. So I'll open it up to questions and discussion. Hope I hit everything you guys are interested in. But thanks for your time. And uh, if you do think you have something to say, record it sooner rather than later. Thank you, guys. Now you said they can fly, but they're not strong flyers, or they, they can't fly. They can fly. They can. not they, okay. they do. They do. They just they aren't fly. good at it. Okay. They kind of crawl around the tree, and uh, you know they'll they'll take off and hit something nearby. So, okay, so they're like a turkey. They yeah, they, they fly, fly like turkeys. Like they take off from a height and they just kind of go. <laughs> um, you know, they're hard to catch with your hands, but it can it can be done. You know, so you you compare that to another pest like emerald ash borer, where it just has huge population sizes. Um, each adult lays tons of eggs, and then it will fly, you know, miles, right? ALB, it can fly, and, and it seems like there's portions of the population maybe we're like artificially selecting for these pioneers that will like just take off and get away and get away from us or whatever. So they'll spread farther. They might catch a, a, a wind current or something and just get thrown uh, like a kilometer away. But kilometer, kilometer and a half. Our protocol is to inspect everything up to a mile and a half from an infested tree. Um, but you know that's just based on our observations of how likely it would be to find something. But they don't like flying. They like crawling around. This is perhaps off the subject, but um, an infestation that's on, that I'm more familiar with is Dutch Young disease. And I have no idea how that, is that an insect too? Or? Well, it's, it's an insect vector. So the, the bark beetle that um, goes into the elm bark carries with it a fungal pathogen. And the disease is actually caused by the pathogen, but it wouldn't get into the, the tissue of the tree without the beetle penetrating that tissue and carrying it with it. So we don't really have anything that we know of specifically with ALB, but it's a similar concern, right? When you have holes and galleries in a tree, it, uh, we see it introducing all sorts of secondary pests and diseases and, and whatnot, but most of all damage. Like the tree just doesn't have the strength it has anymore and it'll break apart whenever it's loaded with us, you know. So we're not, we're, this isn't really like that so much, but it's a concern. It definitely causes um, carpenter ants and you know, other fung fungi to go into the damaged area and hurt the trees more. Well, now they have uh, apparently young trees that are resistant to yeah. disease. How did that? The crossing with resistant species and Individuals yeah, that they're resistant to that fungi. Yeah. 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 So it's, yeah. I'm not so, I don't know much about the beetle that caused that is the vector for that, but yeah, they're resistant to the fall infection, as far as I know. And they're doing the same thing with chestnut blight, too. I'm trying to reintroduce them across the landscape. And where we are, I mean, I see uh, mature elm trees every once in a while, and they're really impressive, but you just don't really see anything more than a couple inches in diameter. So, um, you know, with all of the things you guys have to worry about managing. Uh, forest land for your income, you really don't want to have to worry about one more thing. So, this presentation is intended to give you hope that really it's staying where it, we know it is um, and to increase your awareness in case you do ever encounter it. Give you hope that even if you encounter it, it won't be there forever. That being said, the risk for Vermont is much greater because of how much forest. How hard it would be to deploy resources adequate to stem. Um, we're lucky where we are, but Worcester is really it's a heavily forested city. You know, it's it got a, a great leg up, and in places like uh, Brooklyn, Queens, 
New Jersey and Chicago, like those, they had hardly any trees, so they're eradicated, but that's just because they cut literally everything down, you know? The area in Long Island is more like Worcester, and it was uh, introduced because of that, moving wood outside of the quarantine zone to the disposal yard. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, you know, growing in scale. So we, we, uh, we are definitely going to eradicate in Worcester, uh, but the next infestation, how bad it is, certainly depends on where it is and how long it takes for us to learn about it. Uh, do you have any information on the Emerald dashboard? I haven't heard anything about it in a, in a number of years, so I didn't know if you had any information on eradication efforts. So, Emerald Ash Borer was originally an eradication program. Um, states received funding from the feds to eradicate it, but um, it quickly became apparent that it's, you can't eradicate it. It's a factor of its biology. So that's the difference with ALE. Its biology, it's the way it lives its life gives us an advantage. So um, EAB in Massachusetts, we have it across the state at low populations in certain areas. There's monitoring done by my department uh, on trap trees, um, and, and they do less trapping now, but um, to see it spread and see how fast it's moving. I don't know about Vermont. Well, we have the purple trapping boxes down in Randolph area, mm -hmm. where I'm from. But I haven't heard anything. Yeah, detection. Or this is monitoring at this yeah. stage and yeah. just planning. If you're if you have a lot of ash trees, it, it you know gives you a chance to think about what am I going to do for my wood lot to manage this. So I don't I don't have much to say about it. We don't really do much about it in Massachusetts, but our forest health staff, besides not counting me, it's literally three people, and so most of what they do is monitoring. You know, the ALB program is it's not only the the biggest eradication, the only eradication program in the country right now, but in Massachusetts it's the biggest forest health program because all of our money comes from the federal government, so the state can never be able to swing it on their own. So our, our other forest health people, they work on ALB, but they do gypsy moth monitoring, uh, winter moth monitoring, gall wasps, EAB, a little bit, all sorts of other stuff. Looking for the next bad thing to come. You had a question up there. Well, I was just saying, if, um, it's, it hasn't been really detected in Vermont, but yeah. it's all around, right. and it's most right. likely exactly. here. And we just haven't detected it yet. Okay. Yeah, okay. And, and where you see it in other states is, is really, you know, it's detected in, in most of all the trees. Right. But I, I, ash trees are right. on their way out in the next decade in Vermont, and we're cutting all our ash trees. So, yeah. yeah, I know we've done a big push on Mm -hmm. One of the big differences is that uh, the EAB doesn't really damage the timber. You know, it, it goes into the cambium, which is why it's so bad. But um, you know, compare that with, with ALB, you can't let it sit out there and hope that someone will still get value out of that. It does become really hazardous. It does become really hazardous. Yeah. For yeah. 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 Every yeah. little. Of I want to ask about the uh, just at the current funding level. Do you think you have this that it will remain contained as it is? I'm now? really happy with the current funding level. That's an aspect of my job is uh, managing the budget, mm -hmm. um, and it's our allocation from the there's a congressional line item now for I, I guess wood pass. I'm not sure, but um, that. Part of that goes to ALB nationally. We have to divvy it up with the other programs, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So other states that are struggling to deal with um, not knowing how big the issue is and uh, you know public <laughs> relations issues like Ohio, mm -hmm. they get a lot of money. Um, but for the past few years, it's stayed the same for us, and we don't really need any more right now. We're at the sweet spot. We, what the state does, we take our money. Um, and we have some staff who are more, more subject matter experts. Um, our state, we need that because our state laws permit the federal agents onto the private property in order to conduct the surveys and remove trees. A uh, portion of our money goes towards contracting ground surveys, and the other portion goes towards contracting removals. Um, we manage all of that. Other states are different. Um, and like I said, it stayed about the same with the, and this is the thing, with the fewer and fewer trees being removed each year. Removals used to be 
very expensive because we had to remove we do huge removals to stop it in woodlot areas that it, you know if we had just found it in. and we haven't had to do that so much recently and we're just turning that contract money into more ground surveyors so we have a couple companies that have worked for us in the past that do the same thing our staff do but they just go out and survey and they're really good at it because if they miss something they can get fired so um, that's what I do is I write the contracts for that and they go out and do that we send them out in the areas we don't want to go like crappy swamps and railroads and things like that that are complicated to get into um, and they're just uh, you know very nimble so the more people you put on the ground the faster the eradication is within reason you know because if you go too soon reserving an area too soon you'll miss the damage like I said you want to wait at least two years um, so funding levels are good, and uh, really, I don't know. It's a matter of time. We have to see if there's a federal budget. You know, there hasn't been for a while. Well, it really, this really depends on federal funding. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah it absolutely. It, and and on that being said, if other pests come along, we're always looking at other strains on that federal funding, right? So, um, spotted lantern fly in Pennsylvania just um, is blowing up right now, and that's a huge political. Issue because it impacts a lot of farmers in Pennsylvania. Um, who knows? What if Congress just decides they don't want to add any more money to controlling invasive pests, even if there are more invasive pests? You know, it could take money away from us, but hopefully it wouldn't. Mm -hmm. So at current funding levels, I, I mean, it, the proof is in the pudding. We'll definitely eradicate it, but it will take years to be entirely certain. We're going to have to resurvey. Um, at that two year interval, probably like two or three more times. Mm -hmm. And you said that they're are they fumigating, uh, what is it, pallets that it usually comes Yeah, with? the international standards now, it needs to be fumigated or treated with methyl bromide or heat treated to kill whatever's in it. Yeah. That didn't used to be a rule. Uh -huh. How long ago was this? Uh, late 90s, okay. early 2000s, I think, is when it really. Uh, to affect. And so, the, when you see new outbreaks happening, is it from before that policy? Uh, well, yeah, almost all of them were from before. Worcester was from before. Uh -huh. um, Worcester is one of the more recent ones. Other other ones are related to earlier outbreaks, like Mississauga, Ontario, was from Toronto. I mean, it just went beyond <laughs> the area they were working in. Same thing with New York. Ohio, I don't know. It was founded in 2011. It could have been there for 10 years. I don't really know much about Ohio or the trace backs for introductions, but I do know that they all are separate introductions mostly. Mm -hmm. um, what about pallets that are made overseas? Well, they're yeah. all made overseas pretty much. Is, yeah. is the problem. And they have to be treated? Yes, to get into the country. They need to get into the country. Yeah. And so in China, uh, they have this effort called the, it's an afforestation effort, the Great Green Wall. Right? So they're planting tons of trees um, in monocultures across northern China, um, and ALD is a huge problem for them. They, they like it, they call it the starry night beetle because it's so pretty and charismatic, but it wrecks their, their lumber. So uh, you know they're very cooperative with our program because they want to have less restrictions on shipping, and with that, that regulation is an issue, right? Um, but more importantly, like they need to be able to have wood that hold weight, so they, they're interested in whatever we're doing here to control their own problem. Um, and uh, it's also present in Europe. They have eradication programs in parts of Europe. Um, and it's all basically the same method and approach. So, but these are all introductions. Uh, I mean, smuggling actually is a problem. Smuggling in untreated wood pallets that are fraudulently stamped or whatever, but uh, I don't. I've never heard any good statistics on how prevalent that problem is. I just know it. So it's possible that there would be reintroductions. And it's not just ALB, it's Emerald Ash Bark came over that way too, and so many other insects before you know there were restrictions. The story I heard of Emerald Ash Bark is they planted huge plantations of white ash in China, and then they all got infested with Emerald Ash Bark, they turned into pallets. Could be anecdotal, could be true. I don't know. But that's basically the approach is they plant just big plantations of poplars and maples and stuff for industrial purposes and 
carbon sequestration. So it really it's a it invites problems like that, doesn't it? It's the same. It's analogous to what we dealt with in the middle of Western, but the, every single tree being in order. So, uh, any other questions from you guys? I'll make myself available for you guys if you're interested. I got the wood samples up here. If you guys want to take a little fill up, thanks for your time, everybody. Thank you.